Nearly all wireless technologies rely on manipulation of electromagnetic waves to transfer data between devices. The calculations involved are simple if the devices are stationary relative to each other. But when the devices and systems are moving at enormous speeds relative to each other, some correction factor must be taken into account especially when the data relies on global positioning system, LIDAR, etc. This is one of the many applications of the special theory of relativity, a theory formulated by Albert Einstein. What's amazing about this theory is that it's based on two simple postulates or assumptions, and these postulates are consistent with experimental findings. To explore these postulates and see their profound consequences, let's begin by defining the concept of inertial reference frames. An inertial reference frame is a reference frame in which a body at rest remains at rest and a body in motion moves at a constant speed in a straight line unless acted on by an outside force. So for example, consider this imaginary coordinate system. This system can represent an indoor laboratory or an actual 3D outdoor space, etc. If we have an object that remains at rest over time, then this reference frame is an inertial reference frame. Also, if we have an object that moves at a constant speed in a straight line over time, then this reference frame is an inertial reference frame. If an external force like gravity acts on an object and this object accelerates, then this reference frame is still an inertial reference frame. In a non-inertial reference frame or an accelerating reference frame, your coordinate system is accelerating with respect to an inertial frame. Consider this carnival ride consisting of a rocket being revolved by a steel beam on a fixed axis. If you ride on this rocket and consider the rocket as your reference frame, you will experience a fictitious force called centrifugal force. So this is one guide to determine whether your reference frame is an inertial reference frame or an accelerating frame. If there exists a fictitious force acting on an object, then that object is being observed in a non-inertial reference frame or an accelerating reference frame. Going back to the postulates, consider this galvanometer attached to a closed-loop conductor. When current flows this way, the galvanometer needle deflects to the right. On the other hand, when the current flows this way, the galvanometer needle deflects to the left. If we have a bar magnet and a stationary observer, the observer will notice a deflection in the galvanometer when the magnet passes through the loop with nearly constant velocity. This is because of electromagnetic induction. A changing magnetic flux results to an induced current through the loop. This time, let an observer ride on the bar magnet. Let's call this observer the rider. When magnet moves through the loop, the rider will observe the same deflection. In this experiment, the change in magnetic flux is crucial in generating induced current and hence, it is important in making the needle deflect. But what if we let the loop move along with the magnet? Apparently, there will be no change in magnetic flux around the loop because there's no relative motion between the loop and the magnet. The galvanometer will have a zero current reading. And based on experiments, both the rider and the stationary person will consistently observe no deflection from the galvanometer. If we consider the bar magnet as the reference frame, then the rider is on a stationary reference frame because the rider is moving along the magnet. Because of this, we can deduce that the rider is on an inertial reference frame. However, from the point of view of the stationary person, the bar magnet is a reference frame that is moving at a constant velocity. Hence, we can still consider this as an inertial reference frame. Either way, the physical laws remain the same as long as observers are in inertial reference frame. Einstein noticed this consistency and based on this, he formulated the first postulate of special relativity. The laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. For the second postulate, Einstein examined the experimental results made by James Clerk Maxwell. Consider this stationary car. It projects a light wave with a speed c forward from its headlights. With respect to the ground, the speed of light is c. But what if the car moves with an enormous speed of v in the direction of the light wave? 
using simple vector addition, the speed of light with respect to the ground must be V plus C. But this isn't the case. Light is an electromagnetic wave and based on Maxwell's experiments, even if the source is moving, the speed of an electromagnetic wave in vacuum is still C. This may seem a blunder to some scientists because it violates the simple vector addition of some vectors like the velocity of light and the velocity of light source. But Einstein is such an open-minded person. If the mathematics of Maxwell's equations are consistent with the experiments and the experiments are accurate, then the results must be correct and we don't have a choice. We have to be objective. We should adjust our beliefs based on facts. Since Einstein has a solid basis, he assumed that the speed of light is the same for all observers regardless of their relative motion, and this gave birth to the second postulate of special relativity. So the speed of light in vacuum measured in any inertial reference frame always has the same value of C independent of the relative motion of the source and the observer. Equipped with this knowledge, Einstein tried to explore the consequences of his postulates and made some adjustments to classical physics. The results were astonishing. Our understanding of time interval, length, momentum, kinetic energy, and vector addition is not absolute. But before we dive into those consequences, let me briefly discuss the reality that simultaneity doesn't exist in the universe if we were to embrace special relativity. In other words, we have to discard the concept of simultaneity to reconcile special relativity with nature and accept that light is constant for all observers. To illustrate this point, Imagine this railroad and a train moves along this rail. Along this railroad are two trees being struck by a lightning. A stationary girl on the ground observes these events as simultaneous events because light waves reach her eyes at the same time. However, an observer on the train, let's call this as the rider, observes the lightning nearer to him as the first event to take place because light waves from the closer lightning reach his eyes first, before the second lightning. Hence, the events are not simultaneous when observed by the rider. As a matter of fact, if we look at the point of view of the rider, the lightning events are not simultaneous even if a stationary observer on the ground views the lightning events as simultaneous. In other words, the relativity of simultaneity tells us that two spatially separated events may or may not occur at the same time depending on the observer's reference frame. Since the speed of light is constant for all observers in different inertial reference frames, if an object moves near the speed of light, for example, if an object has a speed v and this speed is near the speed of light, the object is able to cover great distances over a specific period of time. But since c is constant, then the time interval must adjust as well. So in other words, when we consider objects moving near the speed of light, we will be able to measure a different time interval. In classical physics, when we write time interval, we simply write it as delta t. Now notice that I put a subscript of 0 near t because I want to separate the notation for proper time interval and the relativistic time interval. So when we say proper time interval, for example, we have an observer. This is his clock. Normally, when we measure time, we measure time based on events that occur in the same location. For example, event 1 occurs in this location and it happens at time equals t sub 1. And then event 2 happens in the same location and it was measured at time t equals t sub 2. So the time interval t sub 2 minus t sub 1 is the proper time interval. On the other hand, if this observer has its own clock and it measures the exact time where event 1 takes place, in this location, measures event 1 at t equals t sub 1 and then another event takes place at a different location. This observer measures the time where event 2 takes place at another location. Based on his clock, this happens at t equals t sub 2. 
So this time, he's able to measure this what we call the relativistic time. Proper time is measured by an observer where the events happen at the same location. If such events happen near the speed of light, we have to introduce this factor. 1 over square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared to consider the consistency of the speed of light. We will derive this expression on the next slide. If this observer measures the time between events e sub 2 and e sub 1 as, for example, as 1.0 second, when it is measured by another observer wherein from his or her point of view, the events took place at different location. This observer is able to measure a greater time interval, for example, 2.6 Second, So apparently there is this what we call time dilation where one observer measures a shorter time relative to the other observer or the other observer measures a longer time relative to the other observer. So our goal is to derive this expression, a connection between the proper time and the relativistic time. So to do this, consider this figure. We have a spacecraft moving at a constant speed relative to the Earth. And this astronaut inside the spacecraft has its own clock. In figure B, an Earth-based observer, let's call this the stationary girl, observes that the spacecraft moves at a constant velocity with respect to the Earth. Recall that when we say proper time, it is the time where we measure events happening at the same location. So normally, when we measure time, the clock is not moving with respect to the observer. So that's why we call it proper time. From the point of view of the astronaut, when light ray moves from this light emitter and bounces back through this mirror, it traverses a total distance of 2D. And let's assume that the time interval it takes for this light pulse to traverse 2D is delta T sub 0. The speed of light is obviously C. However, when an Earth-based observer observes this pulse of light traveling from the emitter towards the mirror and back to the receiver, this stationary girl observed that the light ray travels a distance of S instead of D. So based on this figure, the light ray was able to cover a total distance of 2s. This takes place at a time interval of delta t and apparently the speed of light is constant. Now based on this figure, 2s using Pythagorean theorem is equal to 2 times if this is s then obviously using Pythagorean theorem this is d and this is l. So using Pythagorean theorem s is equal to square root of d squared plus L squared. Now, if the spacecraft is moving at a velocity of v with respect to Earth, the spacecraft at a time interval of delta t was able to travel a distance of 2l. So, using the simple formula for velocity, v equals 2l divided by the time interval from this point to this point, delta t. So, I can now replace L here with these terms. So, this is equal to 2 times square root of d squared plus v delta t over 2 squared. Now, recall that 2s is equal to c times delta t. Therefore, I can equate this equation to c times delta t. So, I have c delta t equals 2 square root of d squared plus v delta t over 2 squared. In order to derive a connection between the relativistic time and the proper time interval, I could use this relationship to substitute for the distance d here so that I can get a relationship between the proper time interval and the relativistic time. I can rewrite this in terms of d equals c delta t sub 0 over 2 and then plug this d here. c squared delta t squared over 4 equals c squared delta t sub 0 squared over 4 plus v squared delta t squared over 4. So I can cancel all 4's here and then transfer this here 
So I'll have c squared minus b squared delta t squared equals uh, c squared delta t sub 0 squared. So dividing both sides with c squared, I'll have 1 minus b squared over c squared equals delta t squared equals delta t sub 0 squared. And then we have delta t squared equals delta t sub 0 squared over 1 minus b squared over c squared. Then getting the square root on both sides, the relativistic time interval is equal to the proper time interval divided by square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. Due to time dilation, two observers moving at a constant velocity relative to each other measure different lengths. The shortening of the distance between two points based on what is perceived by one observer is one example of a phenomenon called length contraction. In classical physics, when we measure length, we are actually measuring this what we called proper length because by default, for example, when we have an observer, a stationary observer, and this observer is measuring the length of a stationary rod. So by default, when we measure length of a rod, we're actually measuring it in such a way the observer is not moving relative to the target object in which we are measuring the length. So again, when we say proper length, it is the length measured when the observer who's measuring the length is not moving relative with respect to the distance between two points. Otherwise, if you have an observer, this observer tries to measure the length of a moving rod. So for example, this object is moving with the velocity v with respect to the observer, then what this observer is actually measuring is what we called relativistic length. So apparently, if we apply special relativity, the relativistic version of length is equal to the proper length multiplied by this factor. And to derive the relationship between the proper length and the relativistic version of length, let's examine this figure. So in figure A, we have an aircraft moving with the velocity v with respect to planet Earth. And we have this stationary girl. We call this Earth-based observer as the stationary girl. Based on our previous discussion on time dilation, when this stationary girl measures time, it is actually measuring the relativistic time when this spacecraft moves from the Earth to a nearest star. So based on this figure alone, the time it takes for this aircraft to move from planet Earth to the nearest star is delta t. So I could actually write v equals the length traversed by this aircraft is L sub 0 because we could actually picture these two points in space as stationary relative to this observer. Then we call this as the proper length. So I could write the velocity of the aircraft as L sub 0 delta t. And this equation is based on what is perceived by this stationary girl. Now on the other hand, if the observer is inside the aircraft, let's call this as the astronaut, and apparently the aircraft is moving with the velocity v with respect to planet Earth. However, from the point of view of the astronaut, the aircraft is stationary and we can consider this as if the Earth and the nearest star are the ones moving with a velocity that is opposite with respect to this velocity. So from its point of view, the time of travel for the aircraft from this point to this point is the proper time delta t sub zero as what we have discussed from the concept of time dilation. If I try to write the velocity in terms of the length traversed by the aircraft and the time it takes for the aircraft to move from this point to this point, then this is equal to delta t sub zero because this time interval is the time interval observed by the astronaut. Since the calculated speed calculated by the stationary girl and the calculated speed measured by the astronaut are equal, then I can equate this too. So essentially, it looks like this. V equals V. The calculated velocity for this part is L sub 0 over delta T. And for this one, it's equal to L over delta T sub 0. Now, if I try to write this in terms of the relativistic length L, this is equal to delta t sub 0 over delta t. 
times L sub 0. Now recall from our previous discussion of time dilation, the relativistic time is equal to the proper time divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So I could rewrite this in terms of delta t sub 0 over delta t and this will become delta t t sub 0 over delta t equals square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Therefore, I can directly plug this here and I'll end up with the expression for the relativistic length L equals L sub 0 times square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Based on these figures alone, we can deduce that the length measured by the astronaut is somewhat contracted or has a smaller magnitude than a stationary observer. And this phenomenon is what we call length contraction. So for example, L sub zero here is equal to 80 meters. Then an astronaut can actually measure the same length as lower than this value. For example, uh, 50 meters and so on. When two observers are measuring the same length, however, one observer is moving relative to that length, then the moving observer measures a lower value of that length. We already discussed the concept of time dilation and length contraction based on the consequence of the postulates coming from special relativity. However, this set of equations are still incomplete because we have this notion of twin paradox wherein this is the planet Earth. Now on this planet, there are twins and one of the twins is an astronaut and this astronaut rides on a spacecraft so for example this is our spacecraft and one of the twins rides on this spacecraft now this spacecraft moves with the velocity v with respect to planet earth it travels away from the planet earth for a couple of years and then it returns back to the planet earth now if we use the concept of time dilation since this spacecraft is traveling with a velocity v it actually measures a different time the astronaut measures a specific time interval called proper time however the other person that is stationary on planet earth measures this relativistic time from the point of view of the astronaut it seems that it is the spacecraft that is stationary and he can actually consider that the planet Earth is the one moving away with the speed b but in an opposite direction. So it, the Earth is actually moving with the velocity of negative v away from the spacecraft. The astronaut can actually apply the same set of equation in such a way he could view the planet Earth as the object moving away from him and therefore the astronaut can actually calculate a specific relativistic time delta t with respect to the planet earth that is moving away from him this astronaut can imagine that his other twin possess the proper time so that when this astronaut returns to planet earth this astronaut can expect that his twin is the one who is younger and this twin is the one who is older Another way of explaining this is that when the twins are together on planet Earth, they have the same age. But when one of the twins become an astronaut and it travels with a velocity v with respect to planet Earth, it travels for a couple of years and then returns to planet Earth, then this guy here on Earth can actually predict that, dude, you're supposed to be younger because I applied these equations to you. In your point of view, time dilates, so you're actually experiencing a slowing down of time so that when you return back to the planet Earth, you will be younger than I am. But this astronaut argues that, dude, you're the one who's supposed to be younger because I can actually picture this spacecraft as stationary because that's where I am sitting on or riding on and that planet Earth is the one moving with the velocity of negative v with respect to my spacecraft. When I apply this equation, you're the one who's supposed to be younger. So this is basically what they call the twin paradox. Who's supposed to be younger and who's supposed to be older. It's hard to apply 
this equation, this time dilation equation and length contraction because of relativity. Now to solve this paradox, let's return to the Galilean transformation of velocity. To understand the concept of Lorentz transformation, let's derive first the equation for the Galilean transformation of coordinate system. So for example, I have this stationary coordinate system. This is the y-axis. This is the z-axis. And this is the x-axis. Uh, we call this coordinate system as S coordinate system. This is a stationary coordinate system. Now relative to this coordinate system is another coordinate system that is moving with a velocity v with respect to the stationary coordinate system and we call this moving coordinate system as S prime and this moving coordinate system relative to the stationary coordinate system is moving along the positive x-axis this is its y-axis and we denote its y-axis as y prime and its z-axis as z prime and x-axis as x prime we actually describe an event with respect to a specific point in space and time. For example, we have an observer that is in the stationary coordinate system and we have another observer that is in the moving coordinate system. Let's call this as the guy prime. Guy prime. Let's call this observer as the guy primed. When an event takes place at a particular point in this coordinate system, this guy here measures this event E to take place at a distance x from the origin. However, this guy primed is riding along this coordinate system or s prime. For him, this coordinate system is stationary because he's actually moving along with this coordinate system. Therefore, he's also traveling with the velocity v. So based on this observer, at time t, this coordinate system has traversed a distance of vt. So remember that this coordinate system is traveling with the velocity v with respect to the stationary coordinate system. Returning to the observation of guy prime, he actually measures the location of event 1 or this event to take place at x prime because he's actually measuring this event in his coordinate system. But if this stationary observer measures this event if he will consider this distance then he could actually write that the event takes place at his coordinate system which is equal to in terms of x prime it will be x equals x prime plus vt but when it comes to the other coordinates they have the same measurement so this is y equals y prime and z equals z prime now we also have the assumption that the clock of this stationary observer and the clock of this guy primed is running at the same interval so we have this assumption that the measurements made by the stationary observer and the guy primed are the same therefore we could also write t equals t prime or the time interval measured by the stationary observer is the same as the time measured by the moving observer and this is where the inconsistency comes in also we could actually calculate for the velocity of this system we just have to multiply it with the derivative of time however based on this relationship the infinitesimal change in time for the stationary coordinate system is just equal with the infinitesimal change in time in the prime coordinate system so therefore if i try to get the time derivative of each side of the equation i'll end up with for example this one dx over dt equals dx prime the time interval is being measured by the prime coordinate so this is the divided by dt prime plus v because the time derivative of t is equal to 1 and so on. Now instead of writing this as v sub x, let's write this as u sub x so that our notation will not be confused with the motion of the entire moving coordinate system. So let's just denote this as u sub x so on. So applying the time derivative on both sides of the equations, I'll end up with this relationship. The velocity is equal to u sub x equals u sub x prime plus v. Similarly, along the y-coordinate system, 
u sub y equals u sub y prime and along the z-axis we have u sub z equals u sub z prime again if we calculate for the time derivative of the velocity will also end up with a sub x equals a sub x prime remember that v here is a constant so if you get the time derivative of a constant it will be equal to zero and we also have a sub y equals a sub y prime if we calculate for the time derivative of these variables and if we calculate for the time derivative of these variables along the z-axis will end up with a sub z equals a sub z prime now this set of equations are the Galilean transformation of different kinematic variables when we simply apply vector addition and so on. The problem with Galilean transformation of kinematic variables is that it violates Einstein's postulates. For example, at time equals zero, the light pulse originates at the origin. So apparently at time equals zero, the origin of S prime and S coincide with each other. However, after some time t or after some time interval the wave front of the light pulse has evolved into this region so based on what is observed or perceived by an observer at the stationary coordinate system the speed of light would be c so if i try to draw a vector for the velocity of light it looks like this and it is equal to c however when the observer on the moving coordinate system or this guy prime measure the speed of light since it is already moving with speed v relative to s so this moving coordinate has a velocity of v remember it has a velocity of v then when it measures the speed of light or the speed of this wave front it will measure it as c minus v based on simple vector addition if this is the perceived velocity of light by this moving observer then the speed of light is actually c prime equals c minus v but recall that from einstein's postulates whether a stationary observer or a moving observer measures the speed of light it must be always equal to c and not c minus v this is where galilean transformation violates einstein's special theory of relativity now to modify this galilean transformation we now explore another mode of transformation called lorentz transformation so to start at time equal zero the stationary coordinate system labeled as s and the moving coordinate system labeled as s prime coincide with each other in other words the origin of s and the origin of s prime coincide with each other at time equals zero now let's suppose that also at time equals zero we have a pulse of light that originates at the origin after some time for example t equals t so i'm not going to write t equals t just after some general time interval t at time t if this is the stationary coordinate system The moving coordinate system labeled with s prime has traversed a distance v times time also the light pulse coming from the origin has now evolved into this form let's return the observers here and the observer for the moving coordinates is represented by this guy with the prime this is z prime y prime and x prime now when this guy measured the wave front this wave front here with respect to his origin then he can label this as x prime so the distance of the wave front of the light pulse from his origin is x prime however when the stationary observer measures the distance of the wave front at time t is actually able to measure it as x based on his coordinate system so it looks like this however this guy remembers that we have to be consistent with einstein's special theory of relativity therefore instead of writing x as directly equal to this length plus this length like vt plus x prime he will be applying the equations coming from the special theory of relativity which is length contraction and instead of writing just x prime he will write this as x prime times 1 minus v squared over c squared 
So instead of writing the position of the wave front like this, he will now write it as x equals the velocity of this coordinate system times time plus x prime times square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. So rewriting this in terms of x prime, I'll have x prime equals x minus vt divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. When it comes to other axes, like the position along the y-axis and the position along the z-axis, they are equal because this coordinate system only moves along the positive x-axis. So I can equate the coordinates of the stationary observer with the coordinates of the moving observer. So I could just write this as y prime equals y and z prime equals z. Now let me draw the spherical wavefront coming from the light pulse starting from the origin separately for both the stationary observer and the moving observer. So for the stationary observer, we have these S coordinates and the wavefront looks like this. And for the moving observer, let's just write it as this. S prime. So the coordinates looks like this. So if I try to draw the equation for this wave front that is spherically symmetric with respect to the origin, recall that if this has a radius of r, the speed of light is c, so technically r equals velocity times time. So at a particular time, the wave front looks like this for s prime, and at time t, t prime for s prime, the wave front looks like this. So for s prime, the observer at s prime, the radius of this wave front is, let's just label it as r prime. So from its origin towards the wave front, this is r prime, and based on the time perceived by the observer in this coordinate system, r prime equals c. Remember that the speed of light is always constant times time or t prime. So if I try to write the equation for this spherical wave front, this is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared. But recall that r is equal to c times t. Therefore, I can replace this r with c squared t squared and I'll just transfer this on the other side so I can write this as x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c squared t squared equals zero. Similarly for the equation of this wave front, the spherical wave front, I can write it as x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared minus c squared t prime squared equals zero. Now based on this equation, these variables are equal. So I can equate this to this. So to give you a clearer picture, let me rewrite this equation in terms of y squared plus z squared. y squared plus z squared equals c squared t squared minus um, x squared. Similarly, I could write this in terms of y prime squared and z, z prime squared y prime squared plus z prime squared equals c squared t prime squared minus x prime squared. I can equate this term with this term, therefore, I'll have this. c squared t squared minus x squared equals c squared t prime squared minus x prime squared. Now, I can multiply both sides of the equation with negative 1, so I'll end up with x squared minus c squared t squared squared equals x prime squared minus c squared t prime squared. Now using this equation plus this equation, I can derive a relationship between the time t prime of the moving coordinate system and the time perceived by the stationary coordinate system. Let me copy this equation. So I can plug this here. Let me rewrite this equation in terms of t prime. c squared t prime squared equals x prime squared minus x squared plus c squared 
t squared. Now, I can square both sides of this equation. So, I'll end up with x prime squared. And I can plug this x prime squared here. So, I'll have c squared t prime squared equals x minus vt squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared plus these terms x squared plus c squared t squared. So, rewriting, I'll have c squared t prime squared equals x minus vt squared minus x squared times 1 minus b squared over c squared plus c squared t squared 1 minus v squared over c squared. over 1 minus b squared over c squared. So, let me copy this. And continue the calculation here. So, distributing these terms here and here expanding this quadratic terms, I'll have c squared t prime squared equals, so let me expand this. I'll have x squared minus 2x vt plus v squared t squared. So, I'll ex distribute this inside. I'll have negative x squared plus x squared v squared over c squared plus let me distribute this here. So, I'll end up with c squared t squared minus c squared v squared t squared over c squared. Apparently, this becomes t v squared t squared only over 1 minus v squared over c squared. x squared minus x squared is obviously 0, so this cancels out. Positive v squared t squared minus v squared t squared, so obviously this cancels out. So, I'll end up with equals negative 2x vt plus x squared v squared over c squared plus c squared t squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. So, I'll multiply both sides with 1 over c squared to get rid of the c squared in this term. I'll end up with t prime squared equals negative 2x v over c squared plus x squared v squared over c raised to the fourth plus t squared. 1 minus v squared over c squared. Notice that this numerator is actually a perfect square. It's actually equal to t minus xv over c squared squared. So, I could replace this entire numerator with a simpler one. I'll end up with t prime squared equals t minus x v over c squared square divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. So, getting the square root on both sides, I'll now have a connection or a relationship between t prime and t. So, I'll have t prime equals t minus x v over c squared divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So, let me also rewrite our previous equation for x prime. x prime equals x minus v t divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared. And y prime is equal to y. z prime equals z. If we try to write this in terms of the unprimed coordinates, we just have to replace, for example, t with t prime with t and then replace this with t prime. Then reverse the sign of the velocity. So I'll have t equals t prime. So the velocity will be negative. So this becomes plus x v over c squared divided by 1 minus. Even if this becomes negative v, but it's squared. So the sign will be retained v squared over c squared and for x i'll have i'll reverse this sign so this becomes x prime plus 
vt prime divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared and y equals y prime and then z equals z prime. These equations are what we call Lorentz transformation equations. Let's now apply the Lorentz transformation equations to the twin paradox. So notice that in these equations, we assume that the velocity is constant for a specific observer. Now, in the twin paradox, one observer is in stationary coordinate system, like the one that is left on the planet Earth, and the other one is moving with the velocity v with respect to planet Earth. So basically, from the point of view of the stationary observer or the Earth-based observer, the astronaut is the one moving with the velocity v. Therefore, this guy can calculate the relativistic time, while this astronaut can calculate the proper time. Now, the twin paradox asks, if this astronaut moves with the velocity v, with respect to an Earth-based observer and it, it moves away along this path, then after some time, it returns to planet Earth. Along this path, it has a constant velocity of v. Now, this Lorentz transformation can be applied with the assumption that the velocity of one observer is constant. So, essentially, we can apply Lorentz transformation in this path and this path. Now, the problem arises when we have to calculate for the time along this journey because apparently, remember that acceleration means there's a change in speed or change in direction. So, at this region, even if this is instantaneous, there's still a change in direction of the path of the spacecraft or the astronaut. So, along this region, we cannot use Lorentz transformation. This astronaut has undergone acceleration. Now, if we try to add an independent observer, an observer that is stationary with respect to the astronaut. Then both of these person will agree that this astronaut is the one moving and at this region, this astronaut has undergone acceleration before it returns to planet Earth. Now if we add another independent observer, that is moving with the velocity v, the same as this astronaut, then from the point of view of these observers, they could actually consider that the aircraft is stationary and the Earth is the one moving at a velocity of negative v. However, in order to use special relativity, this observer must maintain its constant velocity. So, when this aircraft reaches this point, this observer must continue moving forward to maintain its constant velocity. Now, this astronaut here will lose support of an independent observer if he wants to prove that he has the right to calculate the value of the relativistic time. Since this maintains his speed, then after acceleration, he can argue that the Earth-based observer did not accelerate while this astronaut continues to accelerate. Now, let's assume that the Earth-based observer calculates the relativistic time for the entire journey of this astronaut and he was able to calculate it as t equals 10 years. However, when he tried to calculate the entire time that this astronaut spent in his journey, this observer was able to calculate it as t sub 0 equals 8 years. Therefore, this Earth-based observer can conclude that the astronaut will be younger than him. Also, he can actually argue that the missing 2 years is a time spent during the acceleration of this astronaut. Now, if we try to reverse the process, what if the astronaut calculates the relativistic time and he was able to calculate it as 10 years because he can assume that the Earth-based observer is the one moving based on his frame and that the proper time of the Earth-based observer is equal to 8 years. But this time, he cannot account for the missing 2 years because he's the one who has undergone acceleration while this guy or the Earth-based observer did not undergo acceleration, meaning to say it has been traveling for a constant speed of 
negative v. And this acceleration here is actually the answer to the twin paradox because apparently even if you add a stationary independent observer or an observer that is moving along with the astronaut, both of these observers, assuming that they are maintaining a constant speed, for example, this has a zero speed or this one has a constant speed of v, then both of these independent observers can attest that the astronaut has undergone acceleration. And they can actually argue that the time it takes for this guy to accelerate is the missing number of years for the discrepancy between the relativistic time and the proper time. Now, there are other arguments for this twin paradox that uses other equations, but when it comes to using Lorentz transformation, we can actually argue that the missing discrepancy between the relativistic time and the proper time comes from the instance where the moving observer undergoes acceleration. In classical physics, momentum P is defined as mass times velocity. However, recall that velocity is equal to displacement over time. And since time is involved, remember that if you have two observers and one of the observer is moving relative to the other observer, they can actually measure different time and therefore they can measure different momentum. So in order to account for special relativity or the postulates in the special relativity, we have to rewrite momentum in terms of this. So let's try to derive this relativistic version of momentum. Now let t sub 0 be the proper time. We call that proper time is the time in the object's rest frame. Therefore, the momentum measured by an observer in the rest frame is equal to mass times velocity and this velocity is equal to dx over d t sub 0 or the time interval measured in the object's rest frame. So again, the object has a mass m and it has a velocity of dx over dt sub 0. This time interval is based on the object's rest frame. I could actually rewrite this derivative in terms of dx over dt times dt over dt sub 0. This is basic calculus. Now recall that our relationship for the relativistic time and the proper time t equals the proper time divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if I take the time derivative on both sides, I'll end up with dt equals dt sub 0 divided by a constant 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if I divide both sides of the equation with dt sub 0, I'll end up with 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So Apparently, I can plug this here. So I'll end up with P equals m dx over dt times 1 over square root of 1 minus p squared over c squared. This is equal to velocity. Therefore, I can rewrite momentum as P equals mv over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And this is our relativistic momentum. Let's now derive the most famous equation in the universe. I'm talking about E equals mc squared. We derive this by deriving the relativistic version of kinetic energy. So in classical physics, we define kinetic energy as 1 half mb squared, mass times velocity squared of the object. But if we account for special relativity, then we have to write kinetic energy as mc squared multiplied to quantity 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared minus 1. Let's begin by writing Newton's second law using relativistic momentum. The net force is equal to the time derivative of momentum. Recall that momentum is equal to mv over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. I can rewrite this as d over dt m over square root of 1 over v squared minus 1 over c squared. So essentially what I did here is just I multiplied this with 1 over v over 1 over v. So this is equal to 1. And then try to put this term here on the numerator. So I'll have f equals m times 
1 minus v squared minus 1 over c squared raised to negative 1 half. So apparently, c here is a constant but velocity here is actually a function of time. So I can calculate for the derivative of this term using chain rule. So I'll have f equals, so this is m constant times the derivative of this term which is negative one half times one over v squared minus one over c squared raised to negative three halves times the derivative of this which is negative two over v cube times the derivative of the velocity which is dv over dt so apparently this is equal to acceleration so i could just write this as f equals ma remember that this is acceleration so i'll just put it here and negative one half times negative two is equal to positive one so i'll end up with this term one over v cubed times square root of one minus v squared minus one over c squared raised to three so i can put this v cube inside the square root sign so i'll end up with ma times one over square root of v squared over v squared minus v squared over c squared raised to 3. Remember that this velocity is raised to 3 so I can just directly put it inside uh, the parenthesis like this and if I put it inside the parenthesis this will be squared. Therefore force equals ma 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared cube. So obviously we started with, for example, an object with a momentum P and then suddenly we apply a force on this object and if this object undergoes a displacement of, for example, this position is x sub 1 and then it moves a distance of x sub 2 because we apply a force F. When it reaches this location X sub 2, and when the net force and the displacement are in the same direction, the work done by this force is equal to yeah, W equals force times displacement integrated over this path, which is from X sub 1 to X sub 2. Now, let me plug this here. I'll have M A D X over 1 minus v squared this velocity is along the x component over c squared raised to 3 halves now let me multiply this entire term with 1 like c cube over c cube so i'll have m c cube a d x divided by square root of c squared minus v squared and this velocity is along the x-axis. The only relevant component of this velocity is along the x-axis when it comes to the calculation of the work done by this force. Look at this a times dx. A times dx. I can rewrite this as acceleration is dv over dt times dx and I can transfer this dt over this term. So this is also equal to dv times dx over dt which is equal to vdv. So I can replace adx with vdv. I can replace this with this. Work is equal to the integral of m v the only relevant component here is the component along the x-axis based on this diagram so this is equal to m v sub x dx i forgot the c cube c cube over square root of c squared minus v sub x squared this is raised to 3 have this term is supposed to be raised to 3 now the bounds is now in terms of the velocity so let's assume that Initially, the object is at rest at this position and then it gains a velocity v after applying force. So we could actually write this as 0 and then v. So to solve this integral, every time you see this kind of term, square root of one term and minus another term, you could try using trigonometric substitution because if you try to draw a right triangle like this, so it seems that this term is greater than this term so if we try to write this as c and this one as v sub x then obviously using pythagorean theorem this side here is square root of c squared minus 
v sub x squared. Now, notice that there's a v sub x here and there's a v sub x here. Using this triangle, vx equals c sine theta. If I try to get the derivative of this, dv sub x equals c, derivative of this is cosine theta times the derivative of theta, which is d theta. So we can now replace vx in terms of trigonometric identities. And this, oh sorry, this is supposed to be dv sub x. And then, in order to replace this term based on this figure, c squared minus v sub x squared is equal to c cosine theta. So let me replace the spatial variables here with trigonometric functions. So w equals, so we have c cubed here, a constant, another constant m. v sub x is, based on this is c sine theta. dv sub x is c cosine theta because this is dv sub x. Divided by, this term can be replaced with c cosine theta. I can rewrite this as c squared and this one as cosine squared. So I'll have w equals mc squared sine theta divided by cosine squared theta. Let me continue. This is actually equal to, I'll put this outside the integral sign because these terms are constant. This is actually tangent theta over cosine theta d theta, which is also equal to second theta tan theta d theta. Remember that this term is the derivative of second theta. Therefore, mc squared second theta evaluated from v to zero, but our variable here is theta, so we have to return to its spatial coordinates. So second theta, if we return to our figure here, second theta is equal to 1 over cosine theta. And based on this figure, cosine theta adjacent, this is adjacent over hypotenuse, c squared minus vx squared over hypotenuse, which is c, but this is equated to 1 over square root of 1. So I can rewrite this as second theta equals c over c squared minus v sub x squared. So I can plug this back here before evaluating from z to v. So mc squared is equal to c over square root of c squared minus v sub x squared evaluated from 0 to v. So let's try to evaluate. The work done is equal to mc squared times c over square root of c squared minus v squared minus, plug this 0 here, so c over square root of c squared minus 0. So work is equal to mc squared c over c squared minus v squared minus 1. Let me multiply this term with 1. 1 over c divided by 1 over c equals 1. So I can multiply this with 1. So I multiply this is 1 over c then 1 over c. This is valid because I'm multiplying a term with 1. 1 doesn't change the magnitude of a term. So I'll end up with 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared minus 1. So distributing this term over here, w equals um, mc squared over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared minus mc squared. Now from the work kinetic energy theorem, the work done in increasing the energy of the system when that system is initially moving or when that system starts to move is translated to the added kinetic energy on that system. Now in physics, if an object has a total energy E, so again this is total energy, 
we could actually divide a total energy in terms of an energy associated with motion plus an energy when the object is not moving. So again, the total energy of any system or particle is comprised of an energy associated with motion. Plus, if the object is not moving, there still exists an energy. So we actually picture this energy as kinetic energy. And let's just write this energy or denote this rest energy as E sub 0. So if I try to rewrite this in terms of kinetic energy, this looks like Ke equals total energy minus rest energy. So look at the similarity between this equation. So let me rewrite this beside this equation. Ke equals mc squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared minus mc squared. So it turns out, based on this pattern, we can actually consider this as the total energy of an object and this is the energy associated when the object is at rest. This has a special name and this is what we called rest mass energy. The proper way to write this equation is E sub 0 equals mc squared. Though you could just write this as E equals mc squared. And this is the most famous equation, not just in physics but even if you include mathematics, this is still the most famous equation. So this is the rest mass energy. This tells us that even if the object is completely stationary, for example, we have a cube here, cube of metal. Even this metal is not moving, in other words, it doesn't have kinetic energy, you can still convert this into pure energy and the amount of energy is equal to mc squared. So that's the meaning of rest mass energy. And this has huge applications in, for example, nuclear physics and so on. Let's now consider the relativistic addition of velocities. We represent a stationary coordinate system with S. And relative to this stationary coordinate system is another coordinate system that is moving at a velocity V. So at time T, this coordinate system, which we represent as S prime, has traveled a distance of Vt. Now, if we have an object which we denote as p and it moves with a velocity of u, we represent the velocity of object p with u instead of v so that we will not confuse it with the velocity of the coordinate system s prime. So from the point of view of an observer in the s prime coordinates, the velocity of p has components of u sub x prime, u sub y prime, and u sub z prime. Now, if we let gamma equals 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, we can rewrite the Lorentz transformation for the unprimed coordinates as like this. So, for example, x equals gamma times quantity x prime plus vt. Oh, sorry, this is supposed to be prime and y equals y prime, z equals z prime, and t equals gamma times quantity t prime minus v sub x over c squared. Sorry, this is also prime. Since I try to reverse, this must also be plus v because this is in terms of the unprimed coordinate. If I try to differentiate both sides of the equation, I'll end up with dx equals gamma is a constant. The differential form of x prime is dx prime plus... V is a constant because it is the velocity of S prime. Remember that in special theory of relativity, we assume that one of the observers or one of the coordinates has a constant velocity. And the differential form of T prime is dT prime. Similarly, for others, we have dy equals dy prime. dz equals dz prime. And the differential form of time is dt equals gamma is a constant, so I'll just write it as gamma times the differential form of t prime, which is dt prime, plus this constant multiplied to the differential form of x prime, which is dx prime over c squared. So if I try to derive the equation for velocity in the unprimed coordinate, especially in this coordinate system. u sub x is equal to dx over dt. In other words, dx is equal to this term. So this is equal to gamma 
dx prime plus v dt prime divided by dt which is this one i have gamma dt prime plus v dx prime over c squared apparently gamma cancels out here so this is equal to so let me multiply this term with one for example one equals 1 over dt prime dt prime this numerator becomes dx prime over dt prime plus v divided by 1 plus v over c squared dx prime dt prime so what i did here is valid because when you multiply any term with 1 you're not actually changing its magnitude u sub x equals this dx prime over dd prime is actually equal to the velocity measured in this coordinate which is ux prime so i can replace this with this term with ux prime ux prime plus v over 1 plus v times ux prime over c squared and this is our expression for the velocity of the object p when it is measured in the unprimed coordinate system. Recall that this is the measurement of the velocity of the object p when it is measured at the prime coordinate system that is moving at a velocity v. So for dy over dt, this is simply dy is dy prime over dt, this dt. So I'll have gamma dt prime plus v dx prime over c squared. Let me multiply this term with 1, 1 over dt prime over 1. I'll end up with dy prime over dt prime over gamma multiplied to 1 plus mm, v over c squared dx prime over dt prime. So this dy over dt refers to the velocity of the object p in the unprimed coordinates and it is along the y-axis so this is actually u sub y and this is equal to u sub y prime divided by gamma multiplied to the same numerator here 1 plus v u sub x prime over c squared so notice that when you consider the velocity of object p along the y-axis the velocity of the motion of the prime coordinates affects the magnitude of the velocity along the y component so similarly if we calculate for u sub z which is equal to dz over dt using the same method here we'll end up with u z prime over gamma multiplied to the same denominator here which is 1 plus v u sub x prime over c squared so let me rewrite everything here u sub x equals u sub x prime plus v divided by 1 plus v over c squared u sub x prime and for u sub y we have u sub y prime this time we have a factor gamma here and rewrite the same denominator 1 plus v over c squared u sub x prime and for u sub z we have u sub z prime over gamma times 1 plus v squared over c squared u sub x prime so these are the velocity components of the object p as seen in the s frame among all these examples, notice that if the velocity of the S frame, which is V, is less than the speed of light, then the special relativity velocity addition equations reduce to the Galilean velocity law. For example, in this equation, this becomes U sub X equals u sub x prime plus v in other words when the motion of s prime or the moving coordinate system is very small or not near the speed of light it's very small compared to the speed of light this reduced to the galilean velocity addition law wherein you simply need to add the velocity of the object p plus the velocity of the moving coordinate system when v is comparatively small with respect to the speed of light this vanishes or this is almost equal to zero and this entire denominator becomes one and the same for gamma this gamma becomes almost equal to one at this limit so essentially when your coordinate system is moving at a very low speed meaning to say it's very small compared to the speed of light you simply add the velocity of the object p with the velocity of the coordinate system and since s prime is moving along the positive x-axis it doesn't have effect on other velocity components
This problem is from OpenStax University Physics Volume 3, Chapter 5, Relativity, Problem 25. Particles called pi mesons are produced by accelerator beams. If these particles travel at 2.7 times 10 raised to 8 meters per second and leave 2.6 times 10 raised to negative 8 seconds, when at rest relative to an observer, how long do they leave as viewed in the laboratory? So usually, these kinds of particles are being accelerated in a huge tunnel like, for example, Large Hadron Collider or the LHC. The radius of LHC is almost equal to 4 kilometers. So if we just consider one portion or region of this collider, for visual purposes, we can separate a portion of its tunnel. Inside this tunnel is the particle pi meson. So according to the given, the particle travels at a speed of v equals 2.7 times 10 raised to 8 meters per second. Now its lifespan, when the particle is viewed at rest, relative to an observer is two point six times ten to the negative eight second to determine whether this t sub lifespan is a proper time or relativistic time notice that according to the given this time interval is calculated when the observer is at rest with the particle but since the particle keeps on moving with the velocity v inside the particle accelerator we could actually picture the observer that measured this time as an observer that is moving along with the particle with the same velocity v from the point of view of this observer this pi meson is at rest while an observer that is stationary with respect to the collider sees the pi meson particle as a particle moving with velocity v therefore this value of time here is actually a proper time the, the definition of proper time is the time interval that is normally measured by an observer when it measures event as if that event do not move from one space to another. So again, this value here is the proper time. We wish to know how long do they live as viewed in the laboratory. So essentially, we would like to calculate for the relativistic time observed by a person that views the meson particle with the velocity v. So essentially, we are looking for the relativistic time. So again, in this illustration, this is the person that is stationary with respect to the laboratory. Our target variable here is the relativistic time. And from our equation of time dilation, relativistic time is equal to proper time divided by square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So plugging in the values, we have 2.6 times 10 raised to the negative 8 second divided by square root of 1 minus 2.7 times 10 raised to 8 meters per second squared divided by the speed of light. And we end up with delta t equals 5.96 times 10 raised to negative 8 second. This problem is from OpenStax University Physics Volume 3, Chapter 5, Relativity, Problem 31. A spaceship, 200 meters long, as seen on board, moves by the Earth at 0.97 c, or 0.97 times the speed of light. What is its length as measured by an Earth-bound observer? So based on the problem, the length of the spaceship as seen by someone in the spaceship is when he measured its distance according to this person who is inside this spaceship he measured its length as l sub zero and this l sub zero according to the problem is 200 meters. Based on our previous discussion, this is what we call proper length. We normally measure length of an object or a system with the assumption that those points are stationary with respect to our frame. Since this observer is moving with the same velocity as this spaceship because it is inside the spaceship, technically this spaceship is stationary with respect to his frame. Therefore, the length that he is measuring is the proper length and it is equal to 200 meters. This spaceship is moving with a velocity 
V with respect to planet Earth. This is planet Earth. And this spaceship is moving with the velocity V. So apparently the observer inside the spaceship is also moving with the velocity V. And this velocity is equal to 0 0.97 times c or the speed of light and here we would like to measure the length of the spacecraft based on what is perceived by the earthbound observer so from our previous discussion the length measured by this observer is what we call relativistic length and based on our earlier discussion relativistic length is equal to proper length times square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared so plugging in the values we have 200 meters times square root of 1 minus v squared which is v is equal to 0 0.970 c squared over c squared and we have l equals 48.6 meters This problem is from OpenStax University Physics Volume 3 Chapter 5 Relativity Problem 47. Two planets are on a collision course heading directly toward each other at 0.25c. A spaceship sent from one planet approaches the second at 0.75c as seen by the second planet. What is the velocity of the ship relative to the first planet? So there are many ways to solve this problem. One method is to assume that one of the planets is stationary and the other as the moving frame. So for example, we have an imaginary coordinate system here, x and y. And let's say that one of the planets is planet Earth. And we consider this planet as the stationary frame. So we have an earthbound observer in a stationary frame. We could actually picture this as the S frame. And one of the planet is approaching planet Earth. Let's just assume that this planet looks like this. And these two planets are on a collision course. But if we try to fix the position of this planet, we can consider that the second planet is the one approaching the first planet. Now based on the given, they are heading directly toward each other at 0.25c. This 0.25c is the velocity of this planet when we consider the first planet as stationary. So essentially, if this planet has a velocity v, then this v is equal to 0.25c. So you might be tempted to assign each planet with this velocity. For example, let's say this first planet has a velocity of v equal 0.25c. And at the same time, this planet has a speed of 0.250c. But if we hold this planet stationary, then we have to add this too, if that would be the case. But in the given, it is already assumed that the combined velocity is already equal to 0.25 c's. So the proper way to assign this, if we were to consider both planets as moving towards each other, then this is supposed to be 0.25 c over 2 and then the other one is 0.25 c over 2. But since we already assumed that the first planet is stationary, for easier calculations, then we just assign this entire velocity to the second planet. Next, a spaceship sent from one planet approaches the second at a speed of 0.5c. So for example, the stationary planet is the planet Earth and this Earth-bound observer sends a spaceship. This first planet has sent a spacecraft towards the second planet and if we have an observer on this moving planet, remember that if this is our observer, then it's actually on a moving frame. And based on the given, this observer in the moving frame measures the velocity of this spacecraft as 0.75c and since it's moving in this direction towards the positive x-axis this is positive 0.75c since this value was measured by an observer in a moving frame we denote this velocity as u sub x prime we use the subscript x because it's moving along the x-axis now the question is what is the velocity of the ship relative to the first planet the one that originally sent the spaceship using the relativistic addition of velocities we obtain this formula from previous discussion u sub x is equal to u sub x prime plus v 1 plus v u sub x prime over c squared 
By the way, we must assign a negative sign in this value because it's moving towards the negative x-axis. And since this equation heavily relies with the magnitude and the direction of the velocity or the signs of the velocity, we should be consistent with the usage of signs for the direction of each velocity in the given. So plugging in the values, u sub x prime is positive 0.75c plus negative 0. 5c divided by 1 plus the velocity is negative 0.25c times 0.75c over c squared. We have u sub x equals 0.615c. This problem is from OpenStax University Physics Volume 3 Chapter 5 Relativity Problem 59. So what is the rest energy of an electron given its mass is 9.11 times 10 raised to negative 31 kilograms? Give your answer in joules and mega electron volt. Given is the mass of the electron which is equal to 9.11 times 10 raised to negative 31 kilograms. And if we want to calculate the rest energy of electron, we just use the famous formula E equals mc squared. We have 9.11 times 10 raised to negative 31 kilograms times the speed of light 3 times 10 raised to 8 meters per second squared. And we have a value of 8.20 times 10 raised to negative 14 joules. So this is the energy in joules. Next, we would like to convert this in terms of mega electron volts. Recall that the definition of one electron volt it is the work done on an electron in accelerating it through a potential difference of 1 volt. So in equation, 1 electron volt, using the definition of potential, this energy is equal to charge times potential difference. And this is equal to the charge of electron is 1.6 times 10 raised to negative 19 coulomb times 1 volt. In other words, 1 electron volt is also equal to 1.6 times 10 raised to negative 19 joules. So to convert this into electron volt, we have to multiply it with a conversion factor wherein there is an electron volt in the numerator and to cancel out joules, the denominator must have this value. So this is equal to 0 0.513 mega electron volt. So this value here, your value in this decimal place might differ slightly depending on how you round off the given. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and hit the notification bell button for awesome updates. Thank you for watching.